So the book I'm going to read out of is called The Big Fisherman by Lloyd C. Douglas. It's a book that was written a long, long time ago. It's kind of a nerdy historical fiction book, but um, I love reading so much. And when I first became a Christian, this was a book that I happened to find in the library. And I just loved the fact that, you know, we can read the scriptures and we can talk about Jesus um, and we can think about the fact that he lived 2,000 years ago in the earth and it can feel so distant and disconnected from our everyday life but when you read the historical fiction set in the time it actually puts you there and makes the characters come to life and and makes you think about your own reaction if you were there and I just love it so um so the section I'm reading is on page 114 Tell me, daughter, why are you wearing a man's burnous, and why the shorn hair? Farah's knees were giving way now, and she sat down. The prophet seated himself on a small boulder nearby. Slowly, turning her face toward him, she encountered a searching gaze that compelled frankness. I'm on an errand, sir, that cannot be safely performed by a young woman. I told you that I'm an Arabian because I prefer to think of myself that way, but it is only half true. My mother was an Arabian. My father is a Jew. Your mother's dead. Only three days ago, Farah turned her eyes toward the valley. And that sent you on your errand, I think. And your errand takes you to Judea. And your father is a Jew. Perhaps you go to notify him of your mother's death? Yes, stammered Farah, hoping the answer might suffice. There was a considerable silence before John spoke. So it is something else besides telling your father. Has he not lived with your mother in Arabia? Not for many years. How did they happen to marry? It's quite a long story, sir. I have no wish to detain you. She looked again into his inquiring eyes. Must I tell you? She asked in a voice that seemed a little frightened. Not if you don't want to, said John kindly. But perhaps it might help if you confided in someone you could trust. I'm on my way to find my father, said Pharaoh. He lives in Galilee, at the city of Tiberias. Then he must be in the employ of the Tetrarch, surmised John. There's little else in Tiberias but the great establishment of Antipas. Pharaoh nodded, turned her eyes away. Tardily and in a barely audible, reluctant voice, she said, Antipas is my father. John seemed a person not easily surprised, but he impulsively rose to his feet and exclaimed, You don't mean it. He searched her face and apparently satisfied that she was telling the truth, he said, Of course, I know the story. Everyone does. You have no cause to be proud of your father. I'm quite aware of that, sir, agreed Ferris. But surely, after the cruel and shameful treatment he gave to the princess of Arabia, you're not going to Tiberias to live with this... I have vowed to avenge my mother, interrupted Farah huskily. You mean you would kill your father? If I can. But you can't, exclaimed John. In the first place, it's quite impossible. The palace is fortified like a besieged city. I was born a Galilean, and my friends have told me that the Tetrarch lives like a fugitive, heavily guarded by night and day. You would only lose your life to no purpose at all. And even if you succeeded, which is inconceivable... Your crime would haunt you all your days. No good ever comes of revenge. I heard you say yesterday that there was one arriving now to avenge God, said Pharaoh. Is no good to come of that? John did not have an answer ready. After some delay, he said, That is a far different matter, my daughter. Vengeance is permitted only to God. He will repay. But I mustn't? Pharaoh's tone was satirical. It's all right for God to seek vengeance, but it's wrong for me to do it. I'm supposed to have a finer moral character? That remark reproved John. Does you small credit, daughter. It's irreverent. But practical, defended Farah. And excusable, I suppose, reflected John. He probably had no religious training in Arabia. Why not? Farah demanded. The Jews and Arabians worship the same God, do we not? Abraham is our common father, is that not so? Any further discussion of this matter seemed fraught with more heat than light. John nodded absently. Perhaps you may see the anointed one in Galilee, he said. I wish you might be able to talk with him. He lives in the town of Nazareth. He's a carpenter. 
Disguised as a carpenter, wondered Farah. Same as I'm disguised as a boy. No, he really is a carpenter and a very good one. Whereas you are only pretending to be a boy. And not doing so well at it, she broke in with a pensive smile. However, she added, you are the first one to discover. You mean I'm the first one to tell you? John paced back and forth, frowning thoughtfully. But this is no light matter, he went on. You have vowed a vow. I shall not be the one to induce you to break it. A vow is a vow. You are intent upon going to Tiberias very well. Go first to Nazareth. It's not far from here. Tell your story to the carpenter. Jesus, abide his counsel. You will make no mistake if you do as he tells you. I must leave you now. Since your horse is gone, you will proceed on foot, I suppose. Follow the Jordan. It's much shorter than by the travel roads. And it will be safer for you. May God be with you, daughter, and keep you safe from any harm. And um, the reason why I picked this book is because it really was a huge deal in my journey in following God after I first became a Christian. And for the reasons I shared earlier, it's just that it made the scriptures more personal in that way. It made me think about what I would be like if I was there at that time. It made me realize how many people there at the time when Jesus was alive in the earth, that they were going through the same struggles we do. Um, just the same trauma, the same drama, the same um, injustices. And at the same time, all that, those bad things were going on. There were miracles happening all around. And there was hope being lit in the heart of the city. And so it really just encouraged me to keep that hope in me now, today. So anyway, I like this story. I like that character, Farah. She's a princess and she's wounded. And she sort of lives a little bit like a criminal and doesn't know her identity anymore. And her father was never in her life. And she meets Jesus. And so it's called The Big Fisherman after Peter because he's a, a big character in the book too. And a really good character as well. But I really liked Farah, so that's why I chose to read you that part. So anyway, that's why we chose this one. <laughs>